Imagine if each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing you are happy even while you're dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcasts inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. I'm Emily Zero Threat, welcoming you to explore with me your life of endless possibilities. Aloha. I am so happy to be here today with my guest, Allie Bird. Uh, She has written a really important book that I just, I, it's a resource that society needed. So I'm really grateful to have her here with us today. And we're going to have an interesting conversation. So Allie, can you tell us about you and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Emily. So I am a coach and I have a background in community development and social planning. And I am also a therapist in training. But most recently, uh, at the end of 2019, I became a widow completely unexpectedly. My husband died in a hiking accident and I was thrown into the world of grief without any understanding of what was happening to my brain and my body and the people around me and my environment. And what I noticed very, very early on, someone told me, go find community, go find people like you. And I tried. I joined 13 different Facebook groups. But before I started sharing my story, I was listening to the stories of others. And what I quickly, quickly realized was that most of these groups were used for venting about people's experiences, feeling abandoned and misunderstood and forgotten in their own communities by the people that they love the most. And I wasn't having that experience. I felt very loved and cared for and held and witnessed by the people around me. And also being a more cognitive griever, a problem-solving griever, I decided to put the lessons from my network, my social support network, as well as what I was learning about grief psychology and culture and physiology, and build a tool that would enable people to get the kind of support that I was able to receive um, through my grief journey. And that's how my book, Grief Ally, Helping People You Love Cope with Death, Loss, and Grief, was born. And uh, now I am working on sharing that message and really helping people build the skills that they need to show up for the people they love when, you know, the really hard things happen in life. Well, I I just liked the way you wrote the book so much. I felt like you were talking to me in the book. Mm-hmm. And I, I like that because it wasn't like, like uh, sometimes books are saying, here, do this, you might, you know, and you're not like that. You just, you're saying it like it is. So I, I really felt like we were having a conversation. It was very comfortable to read. Even when you were talking about hard things, it, it still was very readable and helpful. And yeah. so, so many times people don't know how to be a, a grief ally. I, I think that's that's one of the, the really big problems is people would like to give comfort and support to someone who is grieving, but they don't have a clue how to do it. And so instead of saying, I don't know what to do, they just don't do anything. And yeah. that's, that's sad. It is. And I think I think people are so caught up in the their their desire to do it right, to not make things worse that they they do they they freeze and instead of being willing to you know enter an uncomfortable situation and make mistakes because it's inevitable that that you will make them they you know stay a few steps back and really don't show up with with their whole selves and they send the food and the flowers and and a joke and you know hope that if they they don't talk about it or they don't see it, that it will resolve itself and everything can go back to normal. That's so interesting. Uh, You know, (laughs) you know, we all deal with loss of people throughout our lifetimes. And you, you would think that people would learn from their own loss 
what's comfortable or not comfortable, but they, they don't seem to. And you and I have a lot in common when um, I've had two husbands die. And my most recent husband, we had moved to Hawaii uh, two years before he died uh, because he had lived here long before I knew him and that's where he wanted to be. And so that's what we did. But I didn't get to know a lot of people in those first two years because I was busy with taking care of him and, and spending as much time with him as I possibly could. So when he died, I thought, okay, I need to, to find somebody or something. And I joined a whole bunch of Facebook groups and I couldn't stay on them. They just, they yeah. tore your heart out. And I thought, I, I don't need to cry anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that Nobody was really offering comfort or support. They were just telling their story, which they needed to do. And I believe in writing to tell your story, but it wasn't helping me to, to just read that on the groups. So I, I started reading and I read so many books that <laughs> were memoirs. They all turned out yeah. to be like memoirs. And again, it's a good, healthy way to express yourself and and deal with your own grief. It's it's a really good way. I don't I don't condemn any of those. I think that it's it's great, but it wasn't helping me a whole lot. And that's why I wrote my uh book on uh loving and living your way through uh grief. Or not yes. I just realized that I usually have it right behind me here. That's why I was just <laughs> looking at it, but I hadn't moved it over there today. Anyway, it is a, a book that it does have examples of experiences of not only mine, but lots of other people, but it, it focuses on giving you information about different things that you can do at the end of each chapter. There's something you can do, and it, it's a more proactive thing, and my new book that's coming out this spring is called The Grief and Happiness Handbook, and it's it's very proactive with things that you can actually do. And that's what your book is to me, is things you can actually do to help somebody else. Mine mine is uh, could be for the griever or for dealing with somebody who's grieving, or you've, you've really put the emphasis on how, how can I help somebody else? And it's so beautiful. I just love that. Thank you. Yeah, what I noticed too is that, particularly because my my the death of my husband was so sudden and unexpected that there wasn't a go-to resource specifically for the support network. You know, there are so many resources that are written for people like us, people mm -hmm. at the, you know, the epicenter of, of the, the most tragic things, but often, and I don't know if I can't, I know for myself, I don't know if you experienced the same thing, but after Will died, my brain did not work in the way that I knew it could work and that had how it had worked in the past. So it was the people around me that really had the capacity to learn new things and absorb new information. Um, and yet they had to mine these other books and articles and blogs and stuff for the little nuggets of wisdom that they could then apply to the situation. So it was really important to me to recognize how much agency the people around us have when, when someone dies and to give them, you know, a roadmap essentially of here's what the landscape is going to be like. It's going to be shaky. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're not going to, you're not going to have a good time there. <laughs> you're going to make mistakes. You're going to feel anxious. You might be a little bit scared. Um, but here are the actionable things that you can do in this situation with this person that you deeply care for that, is going to help in the long run. Yeah, that's that's so beautiful. So so needed. And I was thinking as I was reading it, it's so wonderful that you had such a a, a beautiful circle of supporters for you. Yes. And I think a lot of what you have in the book is what you learned from what they did for you. Yes. Yeah. They uh my family and my chosen family are a wonderful group of people, very empathetic, understanding, compassionate individuals, which was also another reason why I recognized that there wasn't a tool for them because they are the smartest people I know. They are proactive. And if there was something out there for them, uh, they would have found it and they didn't. So taking the lessons that, that we really learned together, I like to think of the book sometimes as like a love letter to them. 
um, oh. for being able to to get me to you know this this place where I can coexist with my grief and I don't feel like I have to hide it or feel any shame for bringing Will with me um, into the future. They're going to to keep him alive um, within our our circles. It's not just on me to to remember him and keep his memory and legacy alive. You know that that's so important. Uh, often I have people ask me, "Well, what can I say to somebody who's grieving? What's what's going to be helpful?" Or, and I tell them that it's to mention the name of the person who died. You know, yeah. put it in a, a context that that they are going to appreciate. I, I know I just love it when somebody tells me that uh, with shock, he had a beautiful singing voice and people would, would comment on how much they love to listen to him sing. And yeah. with Ron, he was always helping people. And, and I'd have people all the time still give me specific examples of things that he did that changed their lives with the advice that he gave them. And oh. that that feels so good to have that instead of saying, I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> yeah, Which is exactly. Nondescript. <laughs> yeah. I think too, like because so Will and I spent five years together. And the reality of that is that there are some people who didn't get to know him as well as I got to know him. And I think people sometimes worry that, oh, I don't have enough stories to share. Um, but it also just helps to, to ask, like, what, what would they have thought about this? What would they have thought about that? How would they have celebrated this? What do you think they would have done during COVID? And just being able to like bring them, the, the people who aren't there into the conversation is, is such a, a gift as well. And it gives you permission to, to live out and, you know, paint a picture of this person that they were and how they they would exist in the present. I think you're right. It is it is such a gift and it's such a bomb for for a broken heart. And I think, yeah, that if there's one lesson really from the book, it's yeah, like say their name, talk about them. Absolutely. And don't worry about the timelines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it's been three years, five years, twelve years. Yeah, keep keep talking about them. Yeah, I the other day, oh, I, actually a while back, I had my daughter gave me for my birthday an, that ancestor dot com thing, and mm. so I I submitted it and I thought, hmm, well, the results didn't really reflect what I knew, and but every once in a while they'll send things out saying, you know, we've got a hint for you and. They're trying to get you to pay for the service, and I don't do that. But every once in a while, I open them up just to see what what they have on the hint. And I opened one up, and there was this picture of Jacques when he was young that was beautiful. And I'd never seen the picture before. And it was so cool. So I copied it, uh, and I sent it. I put it on Facebook, and I sent it to his cousins because uh, he's like the only one of all the cousins who is is not here still. And he was a lot older than I am. I can't believe that, you know, his cousins are that old and they're all still here. But it's it's wonderful that they are. And they were thrilled to see that picture. And then all the yeah. people who, who knew him when we were together but didn't know him when he was young were just amazed at what he looked like when, when he was a young man. <laughs> and it was so cool to see that. And it, it started so many conversations with, with different people that I had just my, by me sharing that that one picture. So there's, there's always something that you can do to, to bring your loved one up, however you do it. Yeah, absolutely. And it creates like a little ripple. Mm -hmm. I think too, like whether it's you who brings it up or, you know, an ally who brings it up, it creates this kind of permission and this like comfortable space to then, yeah, have these little moments pop up. Um, in the future too. I think that's beautiful. It's really cool. And it, it, it can be funny too. My, my daughter was with him uh, where we were together from the last part of elementary school all, all the way up. He, he walked her down the aisle when she got married and all, all that sort of thing. So they were really close. But the whole time she knew him, he had a beard and mustache. And this <laughs> picture didn't have a beard and mustache. 
And I sent the picture to her. I didn't say anything about it because I just assumed she'd know that was shock. And she, she asked me who it was and thought it was somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> uh, and I just thought that was so funny. Oh, that's but lovely. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice to find things that you can smile and laugh about with people. And it doesn't have to be all, all happy, but when, when you can, it's really neat. And I, it just reminded me there's a new TV series out now called Shrinking. I don't know if you've heard of that. No. And it is so funny. It's, it's It has to do with a, a, a therapist whose the wife died like a year before. And so he's a single parent of a teenager. And it's just a really funny show. But it, it brings up when, when I watch it, I go, oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's true. That's something to think about. And <laughs> it's it's nice to look in grief uh, with a different perspective. Mm. Yeah, definitely. One of my favorite TV shows is Peaky Blinders. I don't know um, that one. Oh, it's it's um, by the BBC, and it's about a a gang in Birmingham, and uh, a lot of them are living with trauma from the First World War. And there, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil it a bit, but there is a love interest um, who mm-hmm. dies in season three. And in season six, this person has been remarried. Um, they have a, a second partner and another child. And the, the main character is, is preparing for their death. And around them, they have all these beautiful images of their, their, the whole breadth of their life. Oh, so wow. their, their, first, their first partner, second partner, other fa- members of their family that they have lost. And it's just like this beautiful beautiful spectrum of how loss can impact your life and still so much else can happen within it. And I think that's, that's the beauty of what can happen when individuals who are bereaved are given permission to kind of bring their losses forward, to not get over it, to not like resolve it by any means. It's like, no, I'm going to carry this with me. I'm just going to integrate it as part of my life. And um, I'm going to remain connected to these people who were so meaningful to me. And that's kind of the world I want to live in too. Oh, me too. I I know I I've uh, I was married to Jacques for twenty two years and I was with Ron for ten, and wow. I married for seven. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, we I, I kept both of their last names. That's why I'm Emily Thoreau Threat. Oh. And it's not hyphenated. People are always trying to hyphenate it. I had to put the the Thoreau as a middle name because otherwise mm. they insisted that I hyphenate it. And I said, no, they 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 weren't joined. <laughs> they yeah. really weren't. I can't, I can't do that. But, you know, I loved them both. They were both very incredibly impactful people in my life. And I remember them both. And I kind of, I feel like I'm honoring them by keeping both of their names. Yeah. That's so beautiful. And doing this work too, yeah. like bringing it, I think the book, the book for me, you know, a bit selfishly is that I get to have these conversations about Will um, and the impact that his death has had on me. But, you know, the, the further we get into conversations, the more lightness it brings as well. And that that's something that I hope I get to do for the rest of my life and that I hope others kind of pick up from the book about, yeah, that that it's OK to talk about these people you know, the fact that we talk about death doesn't mean it's going to happen sooner for you. It's not contagious, all of that. Um, And it's just, it's a really, the impact that it can have on someone is exponentially more positive than what you assume will happen if you bring up someone who has died. Yeah, I I agree with that. Just totally. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Tell me another lesson from your your book that's one of the primary ones you'd like everybody to know. Yeah, one that I feel really strongly about is understanding that grief isn't something that you fix. Rather, it's something that gets integrated, that you adapt to, and your life grows around it. And with that notion, once you change your mindset about like grief support being something where you go into a situation and you fix it, 
what you then can focus on is how to make a person's life more comfortable and easier. And I think those are the principles that I really advocate for in a grief support role. So you enter the situation and what can you do to make this person that you love their life easier and more comfortable? And that can be as simple as, you know, doing the food thing um, that everybody gets told to do. Like meals are important. That makes their life easier. Um, But there's all sorts of other tasks that come with bereavement and a life that, you know, enters this real state of chaos while we figure out how to cope and adapt and survive with with this new hole <laughs> in our lives. So yeah, comfort and ease. Um, yeah, I I believe totally in those things. Uh, whatever that you can do and and you never know what it's going to be. I I had one instance after uh, well actually it was while Jacques was still sick. And we were really kind of isolated because I couldn't go out of the house because I couldn't leave him by himself. And there was nobody to watch him. It's not like he needed a babysitter, but he he really couldn't be alone with the health challenges he had. And uh, we were running out of groceries. Mm. And I started calling those people that said, just let me know if I can do anything and got answering machines and I'd leave messages and they didn't call me back. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do? And it was before the pandemic, long before the pandemic, we didn't have food delivery. We didn't have uh, DoorDash or any of those things <laughs> where people can bring you food to your door. And one day somebody came knocking at my door and she said, I I heard that you your husband is ill and that you're staying with him and I'm on my way to the grocery store. Could I get you some groceries? And I didn't even know this person. She knew one of my neighbors and my neighbors in in that neighborhood, I didn't know anybody. So I didn't even know that this neighbor knew what situation I was in. But she had told her that and she was just coming back from that neighbor's house. And she said she she thought she'd just take a chance and stop by and see if she could help. And it was beautiful. It was exactly what I needed at that moment. And it it just, uh, it was a perfect thing to happen. And Nowadays, it's different because you can order anything to be delivered and and uh, not have to worry about it. But that that was a real lifesaver at, at that point. So there's always something that you could consider some kind of a lifesaver that you can do for somebody who's grieving. Absolutely. And I think, too, that there's there's an opportunity to really focus on like the strengths and assets that you have. So in that context, like that person, you know, didn't go out of their way by any means. They were like, no, this will will be easy for me. Like, I'll drop by, I'll ask if they need groceries and I'll get groceries like while I'm getting my own. And that's totally fine. I think people have it in their minds sometimes that they need to to do these big grand gestures or be everything for one person. And the reality is we both know this, that, that grief is like an endurance event. It is greater than any endurance sport that there is. So to be everything for one person is just, you're going to run out of steam really, really quick. You're going to burn yourself out. So to focus on the things that you are already good at and that you already have access to um, is really important. Like, hey, I'm heading out to the grocery store. Do you need anything? Or, you know, I'm taking the dog out for a walk. Can I take yours too? Or I'm taking my kids to the pool for the afternoon. Do yours want to tag along? It doesn't have to be really complex, wildly expensive, grand gestures to be helpful to someone. No, that's that's exactly right. I love how you put that. Uh, uh, you know, do do what you're already doing well. Yeah, and, and use that to help somebody else. That that's just really cool. <laughs> Uh, I know I made, I have two friends that I just found out had their birthday on the same day for years. I've been making cooking something, these two guys, something um, like a cookie or cakes or something. And they, uh, I thought one was born one day and the other one was born the next day. But it, I found out this week, just kind of accidentally, that they were both born on the same day. So, <laughs> but I, I took them, I'm, famous for this one particular cookie recipe I have. And I thought, well, I'm going to fix that this time because I'd like to have some myself. But (laughs) I did something that I knew really well, knew it was going to turn out. 
And they were so touched. They were so thrilled. And it, it just, I was so happy to just give something that, that I already do. And it, it was yeah. no big deal for me to do it and, and, and to have them be that happy for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And that's a great point too. It's like the lessons that I teach in the book, like it's not exclusive to grief support. Mm-hmm. I think the lessons are applicable to just being, you know, a good friend and a good human in relationship with others. <laughs> you don't have to wait for something really bad to happen to show up for people that you care about. Um, And in fact, the more vulnerable you are in figuring out how to best support each other through the good stuff means that you're going to do an even better job when the unfortunate things happen. Yeah, that's true. Just practice all the time. (laughs) Exactly. We're always practicing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So... I, I love talking to you. I think we could go on and talk for days, but uh, I'm losing my voice again, so I'm going to have to to stop this particular conversation. But to our readers in the show notes, we have how you can get Allie's book and how you can become a grief ally in, in the book and all of her links and things will be there. So do check it out. And I really recommend her book. It, it's good for you, but it's also good for gifts for, for people. And you'll know who the people are who could really <laughs> use it for a gift, but it's, it's delightful. It's, it's uplifting. It's so conversational. I, I really felt like I was sitting, having a conversation with a friend and, and you can tell by listening to this podcast, how easy Allie is to talk to and listen to. So <laughs> I I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So thank you, Allie, very much for being on my show. Oh, thank you so much, Emily. It was a real pleasure to be here and be able to chat with you. Thank you. And to my listeners, we'll see you again next time. And thanks for listening. Do you want more comfort, support, and happiness? Join the Grief and Happiness Alliance. Visit my website at lovingandlivingyourwaythroughgrief.com and read my book, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge on all our episodes on grief and happiness. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode.